Um, we are live. Welcome to tonight's peer support hangout. We are ever so glad to have input joining us this evening to help you with any questions you may have. And I'm going to pass over to the two lovely ladies. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and really, everybody, we are so sorry about the technological issues, but we are on air now. Um, and thank you for hanging in and hanging out. Um, we'll let Leslie introduce herself. Hi, I'm Leslie Jordan. Um, uh, yep, yeah, from Input. I'm the chief exec. And I'm Melissa, and I'm the chief advisor. And uh, between us, we're kind of Input. We are Input. Yeah. <laughs> and we're both Pump users and CGM users. Yeah. And I've had a pump for about 17 years, and I've used CGM for the last six and a half years. And I've had a pump for 10, 12 years, and I've been using CGM for a few months. And between us, because we've been around to lots of industry meetings, lots of conferences, lots of political things, um, we have a good network of people that we know. If we don't know the answer to something tonight, we can probably find out for you. And if there's a question we can't get to or that might require some going back and forth, we can definitely support you by email or phone after tonight. Great. Um, so. We've had some questions submitted to the Hangout, so I'm just going to do answer this question. Do select. And we've got how much pressure is there on CGM manufacturers to lower prices when they have almost monopolies on NHS funding in some instances. Now that's a bit of a, a long question and I think <laughs> we've had something similar before um, as to why is it not possible to subsidize, subsidize the cost of CGM. I think they're kind of similar topics. Um, uh, well I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, I used to work for a blood glucose monitoring company that was developing CGM and that was a few years ago. But I remember how many conversations there were about how many they would have to make to reach an economy of scale. And at this point, they're still assembling glucose sensors almost by hand. There are a few parts of the process that haven't been automated because they just haven't been able to make the machine yet because they just don't have the volume to justify the design of such a machine. So I think what we have to remember is what often gets said at conferences now is if you can remember what blood glucose testing at home with a finger stick was like in 1985, that's about where we are with the manufacturing capabilities of CGM at the moment. So although it seems like these companies are huge and they should actually have plenty of money to throw at this problem, CGM is just a very, very small part of what a couple of the companies involved are up to in terms of their whole business portfolio. And in terms of a company that's solely focused on CGM, they are still trying to become a company that is really viable. Um, they've reached profitability, potentially, um, but only very recently, after many years of R&D and salaries being paid by venture capital. So I'm sorry to give you such a business-focused answer, but in terms of their pressure on lowering prices, they are all working on how they could make CGM more cost-effective for everybody. But just like in 1985, when we couldn't all get finger stick glucose test strips if we wanted them, we're in a position where it's going to take some really big evidence, and it's going to take some changes to how things are made for the technology to become a lot cheaper and a lot more common. So th there's your in answer from the bank, so to speak. Um, <laughs> Leslie, would you like to pick up right. on the in, other part? In the meantime, you can subsidize the purchase of them by buying them yourself, unlike with pumps, because they've been technology appraised. Either you buy the whole process yourself and, and have the appointments privately as well, or you have the whole lot from the NHS. With CGM, you can, you can have your support and advice from your uh, NHS clinic about it, but you can buy it yourself. One of the brands, you also don't need to have a doctor's approval to do it. What, another of the brands, they like to see a letter from your clinic saying, yes, they support your need for it. But it is possible to buy it outright yourself. Um, it's, uh, there's no obligation on the NHS at the moment to provide any money for anybody on it. It's, it's, uh, and it's becoming more and more difficult for any individuals to get funding for it. But we're working on that process. It hasn't been nice technology appraised yet, so there is no obligation. But there's nothing stopping individual CCGs from, from um, providing it either. And in fact, we've been contacted recently by 
a couple of CCGs and um, and a more central body looking at making a fair um, policy for making it available to, to people. So this is starting to move. This is a really exciting time. But with the nice technology appraisal that would make the funding mandatory, the, the thing was they didn't want to push it, the manufacturers didn't want to push it too soon because until we have the evidence that says yes, this is going to be definitely cost effective for the NHS for a certain group of people, then it's better to have no technology appraisal at all rather than one that says, no, this really is no good, because then it would be looked at again for another five years or so. Yeah, five years if you're lucky, in fact, because the 2008 appraisal on pumps was supposed to be reviewed and reissued in 2013, and the consultation of stakeholders has not yet begun, and we're at the start of 2014. So we could have ended up getting locked out for even six or seven years yeah. after having a no on CGM. And that could have set everybody back. It would have meant that some people who may have had funding for CGM could have lost it, which would have been really sad. And it would have meant that instead of there being the opportunity for a clinician to say on a case-by-case -case basis, I really think this helps, there would have been a much harder hill for them to have to come up with a good argument. Um, and it would have also put the UK back in comparison to some countries in Europe, which would have been really sad and embarrassing. It would have been a good place to start with negotiation. So um, I have to say, I know it feels like everybody has it, but actually think about how many people are not using it. Um, at this point, there's way more people who aren't even testing their glucose level five times a day than there are people who are using this technology. Yeah. Um, it, it, it appears to us that the vast majority of adults that are using it are self-funding. Um, and from my own experience, it is possible to make sensors last for longer than whatever brand you used to last for longer than the recommended time. And that certainly brings the price down. Yeah. And the manufacturers aren't allowed to tell you about any of that because it would be against the rules and they would get in a lot of trouble. But if you seek support from other people who are using the devices, you find out tips and tricks that might help you out. And that's something that, as users, we don't just send out loads of lists of things that we do, but we can certainly point people in directions where they can read blogs about people's experiences. They can um, join a community where people are sharing ideas with each other. And I think that's really important when you have diabetes, whether you're actually trying to find out how to use something or you just have had a day and you want to chat with other people. So it's not just about you know quid pro quo, get something you came for. Yeah. I've found since I've been involved in the online community, which was really since I got myself uh, a pump, I, I wasn't involved before then, I never used any support groups, but since I got a pump I've been involved in the online community and it's been the most effective psychological care I've ever had. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so is there another question to move on to, Amy? Have we kind of covered this one? Um, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've got Another question from the Q and A's on the sidebar, um, which mm. it says that's from Patty. Uh, despite nice guidelines saying that if you qualify for a pump, the PCT PCTs should not deny you one on funding grounds. It would appear this is still happening in many areas. How can this be overcome? Contact us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I find is most of the time when someone contacts us and says this is the problem, I've been told there's not enough funding. I say go back to your team and can you please ask them to send you a letter in writing or an email, just something where they've written down. The problem is that we just cannot get the funds released by the CCG. Um, just for clarification of terminology, PCTs were all abolished as of April the 1st, 2013. So we have to call them CCGs now to be correct. So that's why I try not to say PCT, I get confused. Um, but if that person goes and asks, usually the answer is, well, what we meant when we said funding was that somebody's on maternity leave and we haven't got funding for them to have their replacement paid full time. So what that really means is that we couldn't put you on a pump for eight months, but we didn't want to get your hopes up. And the patient goes, eight months? But the consultant says, I need a pump. Now, why should I wait eight months for something that can help me sooner? And in those cases, usually the most productive thing is for the patient to say, I'm going to go see my GP and go and get referred to a different hospital with a larger pump clinic and more people who can help with the training. One of the things that frustrates some people who contact us is they say, if my clinic told me 
last year that they just did not have the capacity, I would have not been upset. I would have just said, okay, I understand. I'm going to see my GP and I will talk about getting to a different hospital. Or they would have asked their clinic, what can I do instead? And one of the things we have to remember is that under the tariffs that the hospitals get paid by within the NHS, it's not in their best interest to tell a patient to go away. Mm -hmm. They don't want to tell a patient, I'm sorry, I just can't help you. They say, wait, and we'll do our best. And because they're nice, nobody as a patient wants to get very upset until it's been a really long time. So sometimes people contact us. They feel they're at the end of the rope. They feel that they live in a very bad area, and they wish they could move house because they think things are much better if they go somewhere else. But in fact, um, it could just be that it's their hospital. And only in the last, um, see what, in the last two years, we've had two conversations which turned out to be people inside of the administration of a PCT, because we haven't heard it from a CCG yet, no. um, saying, oh, really, we have to do that? <laughs> um, but we've had a couple hundred inquiries from people who said, I've been told the problem is funding. So um, it, yeah. it's about scratching the surface and finding out what they actually mean by funding. Because, mm. you know, in brief, what it often means is we haven't got the funding for enough staff. Or we haven't sent enough people on training, yeah, and we haven't prioritized it as a clinic that actually we must figure this out. Um, and if your clinic hasn't prioritized training lots of people on how to provide pump therapy, then maybe their support wouldn't be as great as a clinic that has prioritized that. And things do change in time. We know a lot of people who had to move hospitals a couple of years ago in order to access a pump, but whilst they've been away attending a different hospital, their home hospital has upskilled. And sometimes they've been asked, would you consider returning to the previous hospital? Because actually, I, as a DSN, have personally been training the people that used to say they couldn't help you. And sometimes people are returning to other services. So it's nice to see that there is a groundswell of support going on. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. I shall mark that question as done. Um, people in the room, any questions for Leslie and Melissa? Um, well, I've been uh, fitted with the CTM just for 10 days to try and map some patterns. Um, and I just wondered, as uh, CGM and pump users, how much you find the CGM kind of helps your diabetes? Are you using it where you can see the numbers, or are you on a blinded one? A, a blind one. I'm getting a pump. Well, they're applying for funding for pump at the moment. Um, but I just kept getting nighttime hypos and wasn't waking up with them and then getting them sporadically through the day and there doesn't seem to be a pattern so they thought they'd fit me for 10 days to see how I went. Um, but yeah, I just wondered in terms of applying for pumps, how, like how, in, some of them come with CGMs, but whether you feel it's made a, a, a difference or, or how it kind of helps you. Do you want to go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, my exposure to CGM started when I was working for that blood glucose monitor company, and that was 2006. I first had the opportunity to try CGM, and I thought I had everything right with my pump because I'd, I'd been on a pump for 10 years at that point, and I knew what I was doing, and everything seemed fine for me. Then I had a couple of extremely scary hypo incidents when I was at work, and well, one at work and then one at home when I was alone because I lived by myself. And I went to see my diabetes consultant and told him that these things were going on. And he said, I'm really worried for you. I'm not, I don't think that you're going to be safe because if you did not have hypo symptoms until your glucose level got down below two, um, and then you could barely get the strength to go to the fridge and get yourself something in a you know, very small one dead flat, then um, you could be in real danger. And I thought, okay, that's weird. My hypo awareness had really gone away. And I had to think seriously about what I needed to do for myself because before those incidents, if I just kept my levels a little bit high, maybe target of 8 instead of a target of 6.5 for a few weeks, I could get my symptoms back. But that stopped working. And that's why I needed CGM at that point was that if I wanted to know where I was going and to be able to have confidence about a lot of situations, I needed some backup. And in those days, the technology wasn't as good as it is now, but it still helped me to see when things were going up or down with my glucose levels without the symptoms. 
Um, so for me, that's also the reason why the funding application was successful, is that I would have to have run my glucose levels quite high, even having a pump, in order to protect myself from hypos that I wouldn't feel. And I would have then had a greater risk of bad, bad hypos. So that's kind of where the strength for my argument came from. Um, and yes. I have found it very helpful. I keep using it, even though it's an extra little fiddly bit, and sometimes <laughs> in the way and sometimes it's not always right but I do get value from it. I've been using CGM since April and I'm fully self-funding and it's still worth me finding that money to do it. Um, yeah. Since using it I've found that my HbA1c has come down by a whole percentage point in old money. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you ask the question on the Diabetes Online community about which piece of technology would they prefer, if they could only have CGM or a pump, which would they go for? A lot of people would say, I'd, I'd just have CGM, but actually I'm the other way around. If, if it was only one, then I'd go for the pump, definitely. Because I had problems with um, reli reliable absorption of my insulin. So um, if I was injecting, CGM would just be showing me how, how helter-skelter I was. So definitely yeah. the pump for me. But other, other people would disagree. Yeah. And at this point, we're looking at the paradigm of if your pump hasn't sorted you out, then maybe CGM can help. Whether this will change in the future with new insulins that get created and with new understanding of exactly how our bodies work, it's amazing how many discoveries about the human body the artificial pancreas researchers are making because they're actually putting technology on people and giving them food and then going, whoa, that's what happens when you eat pizza? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> And you know the fact that just in 2012 we had a new research paper about the effect of a high-fat meal on people's blood sugars. I thought if you got 12 people with type 1 in a room and asked them what happens when you eat a high-fat meal, you would have saved a few million dollars. But yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but it takes time to validate these things, and because that stuff is going to be built into new generations of technology, maybe one day we'll have an insulin pump that actually asks us not just how many carbs are you putting in, but is this a low-fat meal, a high-fat meal, how much fiber is there, and maybe there will be better decision support than we currently have. Um, in Poland, for example, they actually do count fat units and protein units when they do their dosing. I learned about this just last summer and it is pretty complex as a calculation. It's definitely not as simple as carbs. But they also have lower basal rates in comparison to how much insulin they take at meals. So whether we are sort of covering our fat and protein units by having slightly higher basals on this side of the pond, so to speak, um, it, it's a question for researchers. But it all just shows you how much of diabetes is an art rather than a science. And if you have random bad hypos, the thing that's proven in research to help is a pump. Um, I was yeah. going to say that there's um, new research coming out all the time. I mean, the dawn phenomenon has been kicking around for donkey's years. Everybody's heard mm -hmm. of that. But how many of us have heard of the get up phenomenon? I only heard about it recently. Um, those times when um, you, you you have a spike after getting out of bed. It doesn't matter what time of day it is, it matters what time of day you get out of bed. And it's not, it's not actually a delayed dawn phenomenon, it's to do with getting out of bed. Um, and when I heard about that in the presentation, I thought, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And now, now that I've, I'm aware of that, then I can keep an eye out for it. But it varies every day. Um, so sometimes I'll get it, and sometimes I won't. And that's also something that I learned about dawn phenomenon. The stronger your dawn phenomenon is, the more likely you are to have a massive hypo every few days because it doesn't happen every single day. So if you've, whether you're on injections or a pump, if you've set your basils to cover your, your usual dawn phenomenon, then there's going to be a day every now and then when it doesn't happen and actually you're having far too much insulin. So actually, those of us that are managing to go day by day and you know survive pretty well and keep well and stay out of hospital with all these things that are against us and all these variations it's not just what you're eating and how much exercise you're having there's so much going on in our bodies that's mm -hmm. still only just being discovered we all do pretty well to manage as, as well as we do yeah. <laughs>
So in terms of your very first question, like whether you should get a pump that offers a CGM with it or not, you always have the option of getting a standalone CGM if you find that the pump that would suit you from the get-go isn't with a CGM. But if the one that you want does have CGM with it, then you have the opportunity to add that sensor at your own cost or with some support from your clinic along the way and see how it goes for you. Um, remembering that in the next few years there will be so many new things coming out that we can't even necessarily predict right now. It, it is getting a, a tougher thing to commit for four years. When I first got a pump in 1996, four years, the year 2000, everything was supposed to be so different, but the manufacturers had only brought out a new product once every five years up to that point. So I thought, well, if you even have a new product by the time this warranty expires, and now we're on a cycle of almost an 18 month, mm -hmm. and it's narrowing to 12 months, mm -hmm. and I got a replacement pump in April, and I'm like, damn, you know, it, I might miss something really cool in the meantime, but by the time that I get something new, it might be awesome. So we have a lot of different uh, time scales now, you know. Yes. Oh, and just to just to throw in something that's quite timely, I was just feeling quite um, like you know not quite right. There's something off. Just checked my handset, and I'm steady at six. So it's obvious because I'm excited about our chat rather than feeling like that. <laughs> yeah, it's and really nice to confirm it. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're frightened what they're going to say next. Yeah, <laughs> live on the internet. Yeah, that was scary. Um, just thank you very much. Thank you. Um, timing. Um, Heidi has asked or has said, I'm having an insulin pump fitted early March. What will be the changes I will see to my control early on, if any? I know this isn't quite what we had as the main topic, but I thought um, you guys might be able to help with your experience as well. Uh, well, the first change is going to be you're going to have to write a lot of stuff down mm -hmm. for a while <laughs> and figure out what works for you because once you remove the sort of blinding factor of having your long-acting insulin, you might find out that you need different amounts of insulin for meals than you thought. You might find out that actually your basal rates that you first get don't work when you have your period and you're going to need to figure out what works for you in your PMT days and also in the days when you're actually having your period. Sorry, it's a bit of a girl chat for the guys <laughs> in the room, but that's something a lot of women I've gotten in touch with who used to just have the occasional um, wobble with their glucose levels before or during their cycle um, actually said, whoa, once the long-acting insulin was off the menu, I realized that I actually had really significant changes in my levels and I didn't have to just eat extra those days or just starve myself those days. So um, that, that's something, learning curve, I think be prepared for a learning curve is the biggest um, yeah, thing I can say about your control. And sore fingers. Yeah, lots of testing. Um, but also, like, working with your team, it might be a really intense time to learn about your own body and yeah. to expect some more support from your team. Um, Work with them. If they say, send me this information this day and we'll have a chat, it's going to be worth it to do that, even if it sounds like extra work at the time. Mm. Um, I'd also say, in terms of the reason why you're getting a pump, if you're getting a pump on the high A1C criterion, you might also find you have fewer hypos once you get a pump. If you're getting a pump on the basis of lots of hypos, but your A1C was really fabulous, your A1C might go up a little bit. So give yourself some time. Um, we used to say in the old school that it might take three times to get something right, and Christmas comes just once a year. So you might have to get it wrong two Christmases before you actually learn how to eat that special food that you only eat on Christmas. Yeah. Um, and it's not about getting it perfect, and it's not about, oh my god, if I don't reach this particular target within three months, they're going to take my pump away. It shouldn't be phrased like that. It should always be a what are we going to do conversation and if you're holding up your end of the bargain and your nurse keeps moving appointments, then you have some traction. Um, but um, I have to say that I found it after about two weeks on a pump, I started to get frustrated because I saw from day one, I saw immediate benefit. But then it, it's a bit chicken and egg. You've got to have your basils right in order to get your bolus ratios right and you've got to get your bolus ratios right to
to get your basil right. And there's you know a, a fair amount of fasting, um, one missing one meal a day, and you know not doing it all in one day, and so on. But as soon as I could see the light at the end of the tunnel and how wonderful it could be when everything was settled down, when I had my ratios correct, when I had when I knew exactly what my correction ratio was for different times of the day and so on, I could see how much better it was going to be. But all that mm. stuff takes time. You know, you've got to live through those days. You can't do it all at once. It, it all takes a few weeks to work out. Yeah. And I started to think, oh, if only I knew what this was and I could get that perfect. Um, so, so yeah, just just within, you know, just out of reach is this fabulous control. Um, but you've you've got to you've got to put in the work to get there, and it takes time to do that. Yeah. So, so don't being, expect to everything to be perfect straight away. And give yourself patient. some time. Yeah. Yeah. And being patient with yourself, so that you know, okay, if you get it wrong today, you have tomorrow to try to do it again. Um, one of my good friends who has a pump and I got together for coffee a few years ago and it was just after the holidays and she said to me in a very serious tone do you know how many carbs are in a Starbucks mince pie and I said I uh, don't know um, I threw out a number uh, 60 and she went how the hell did you know that because it took me four to figure it out <laughs> and I was like Four? And she's like, yeah, I got it wrong the first time I had one. A couple of days later, I had more insulin with it. I thought it might be 35 grams of carbs. And, you know, each time she took more. Um, and then finally, she's like, now I'm sick of Starbucks mince pies, but at least I know the answer. Um, and now they are better about giving us the nutritional information than they used to be. Um, I suppose the other thing to think about in terms of control is that you might find more freedom in eating because you don't have to inject every time that you fancy something or every time that somebody passes around a treat and I am really used to hearing from people I got a pump and maybe if they were a little bit overweight before they got the pump they didn't have as many hypos they didn't have to treat as often they sort of lost some weight when they first got the pump or they maintained their weight and then maybe it started to creep up a bit and they started to think oh dear you know where's this weight coming from and my phrase is always, you'll learn to eat how you like with a pump. Now you're going to learn how to exercise with a pump. <laughs> uh, so there's lots to keep learning. And there are different styles of bolus that might work with different foods. And you might find that you get some hypos after meals when you figured your carbs correctly. And the solution to that could be to work with your team on figuring out how to use the combo or the dual or the extended, whatever your pump calls it, bolus and read more books. Um, a lot of people I talk to have never actually sat down and read a book about diabetes. Well, I've had it 20 years. What could a book ever teach me? Well, um, the doctors <laughs> may not have diabetes. That's not the only reason that they need to read books. Um, we need to read books too or go to support forums and get the tips on whose videos to watch if we're not up for the book version. Um, I always tell people there's a book called Think Like a Pancreas and you should read it. Yeah. It's by Gary Shiner, and he's a long-term type 1 who's a diabetes educator in the U.S. And Gary absolutely gets it, and he's heard so many stories from so many different types of people as a, a clinician and as a friend and as a peer that he knows we're all different, but he knows some things tend to work, and if they don't work, how to find more information to help yourself. So um, that's a great book to read before you go on a pump, and then probably again after you've been on a pump for a couple of months because your perspective will change. Yeah. Talking about perspectives, um, your your satisfaction with your control might change as well. When I was on injections, if my first thing in the morning test was in single figures, I was delighted. That was a good day. Now, if I wake up and I'm 7.5, it's a disaster. What went wrong? 7.5? I should be 6. 5.5. So um, <laughs> my control has actually improved hugely, but I'm not necessarily hugely impressed with it because I expect so much more now. <laughs> now so when you start giving yourself on a, um, you know, tighter and tighter goals or for women if they're trying to target having a family, you know, the amount of pressure we put on ourselves and the amount of pressure we might feel from our team can affect our level of satisfaction. So it's important to sometimes take a step back and mm -hmm. think, is this really the end of the world? Or am I actually probably doing okay? And all right, if I think I need to do something different, what is it? And remain engaged because it doesn't actually automate anything. 
The only thing it does is every three minutes it kind of goes zoop by itself. The rest of it's up to us. Um, yeah. Next question, maybe? Sorry, I had my microphone muted. Um, we've got a question from Michael, which um, says, I'm, const I'm being constantly passed around between my GP team, dietitian, and diabetes specialist for a refer referral I asked for 18 months ago. GPs say I'm not eligible despite meeting criteria. How do I get one then? OK, so this is about access to a pump. Um, the first thing is the GP shouldn't be making that decision because it's not within the NICE technology appraisal for the appraisal to be made by a GP. It says that the um, therapy should usually be supervised by a specialist team with the training. And so it's unfortunate that this has happened, that Michael's been in this situation. Um, the first thing that I can think of is to go to the GP and make it very clear, um, I need a referral to this specific hospital. Input keeps a list of hospitals that we understand to be very good at pump therapy on our website. You can just go online and you can click the little tab that says insulin pump therapy and then in the drop down menu there will be pump clinics. You don't have to go to the one that's closest to your home. You can go to anyone if you live in England that you are happy to travel to. You may have your GP saying, oh, I'm not supposed to refer you to one of those clinics. You can only choose from these ones. We can usually help if the GP is a bit of a barrier on that access point. Um, if you're in Scotland, Northern Ireland, or Wales, the access to the services is different, and we'd probably need to hear from you directly, and we might be able to give you some more support personally. Um, but the access should be simple if it's England, and then you just wait a couple of months for an appointment letter to go to that clinic. And of course, they have to get to know you a bit. They're not going to walk in you know, first appointment, what's your name? Oh, what's your A1C? Here, have a pump. That's not how it's going to work. And there might be some things that would help a lot with your control between showing up at the new clinic and the decision about a pump. Sometimes people say to us, I feel like I've been waiting so long to get to a clinic that actually even does pumps, and now they tell me I have to go on the stupid course, Daphne or Bertie or Insight or whatever it's called at that clinic. Um, actually, it's worth going on it. Not only can the clinic say, yes, we have given this patient structured education, which is the first thing that they should have if their diabetes is out of whack, uh, but you'll have all the tools that you need to start preparing yourself if the pump is the right thing for you. You're going to approach it with a much higher level of knowledge and understanding about how diabetes works, how your diabetes works, and that there are tools that you have at your fingertips to help yourself. Um, so that's the kind of the potted answer on being bounced around is that if it's unfortunately the GP shouldn't be the one making the decision. If the GP refuses to make the referral, absolutely refuses, you do have the right to register with a different GP if you can find one within your local area that you're happy to go to. NHS.UK has been updated with lots of rankings and people's feedback about different GP surgeries. And you can just type in your postcode and see who's accepting new patients, ring them up, and make sure that you fall in their catchment area. And go along with your NHS card or the letter that replaces your NHS card and say, I'd like to register as a patient. There's no blacklist. There's no, oh my god, I heard about this patient. I'm not taking them on my list. That would be so unethical, I can't even tell you. So, yeah. I hope that helps. Um, absolutely perfect. Um, Carly has asked, does lifestyle add to your pump application? E.g., she's a teacher and can't inject in the middle of the class when she's hyper. Um, that shouldn't be a problem, really, uh, because the criteria aren't really around lifestyle. Um, one of the things to bear in mind is that the definition of disabling hypoglycemia that's in the NICE technology appraisal is not how many times a year are you in hospital because of having had to get an ambulance out and have glucagon. It's not like that. Um, a lot of people who find that they are just having trouble managing their diabetes, if they see a consultant who understands where they're at, um, their hypos may in fact be disabling. Um, or if the A1C is high, if it's above 8.5 despite a really good level of care and being on MDI, then you know they'll qualify straight off. Um, there may be reasons why somebody who meets the criteria isn't necessarily a great candidate for a pump. And that's the other thing. It's not an automatic right to a pump, I meet the criteria, hand me one. It's always down to the clinician's judgment. 
There are some people who, for any other reason, would not necessarily get on with a pump. And so I always remember that there are two sides to the story when someone's been told that maybe they're not right for a pump or a pump's not right for them. And also getting a second opinion can help a lot. You do have the opportunity to say, I'd like to be seen by a different doctor in this particular hospital clinic. Or you can, as I mentioned before, for the, um, the situation of being bounced around to different GPs and hospital um, opinion leaders, you, know, you, you can say, I'd like to see a different hospital um, for a second opinion. For a second opinion. Yeah. Um, so I hope that helps. The, the lifestyle point, we hear a lot about it. People would like to lead with their lifestyle because they believe their lifestyle is really important to them. But actually, the NHS doesn't measure outcomes and whether people are healthier on the basis of their lifestyle. Um, thank you. Um, are there any other questions in the room before I go to some of the questions we've had from Facebook and Twitter? Um, uh, as a type 2, can I just ask a, a really stupid question? I don't understand the difference between CGM and POMPs and what the difference, what the difference is. Okay, um, CGM stands for Continuous Glucose Monitoring. Uh, a sensor is placed beneath your skin, just like uh, where an injection goes, uh, and gives a reading every five minutes or so about the level of glucose in your interstitial fluid under your skin. So it's, it's, uh, it provides an extra level of information to blood glucose testing. So whereas your blood glucose testing, maybe you know four, six, eight times a day, might show that you've got perfect control, CGM may show the ups and downs that you're having between those points. A pump is something that delivers insulin. So it's, it's basically uh, um, a, a, um, a computerized syringe that just pushes in insulin. It's a very basic, clear explanation. Yep. And you're also able to learn more about the different ones that are out there. If you come to the input website and you click on the insulin pump therapy tab and also on the continuous glucose monitoring tab, you can read some descriptions of how the products work and that might be helpful. We've got some links on our site too that go out to different blogs and different articles on the web. Um, I suppose, you know, for us who've come up since before CGM was available, We've seen the timeline and the progression, but for somebody who's new to all these abbreviations and different um, terms, it can sound really confusing. So, good question. Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah, got a thank question, you. if I may. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Um, so, my daughter's been on a pump since June, and uh, it's, it's going very well, um, and sort of thinking about CGM, but... One thing that worries me is if we start funding CGM and then for some financial reason we have to stop, how how would we feel? I mean, have you ever gone without using CGM and do you all, that it, you're sort of missing a part of your care? Does it make you really nervous or, you know, I just sort of, I'm a bit concerned that if we stop, you know, we might see it as a big negative thing. I can understand that, yeah. Um, I choose to go without CGM at the end of each sensor for a varying amount of time. Sometimes it's just a few hours, sometimes it's a few days. Um, it just gives me, I don't know, um, but so yes, if I was to go without it, having used it for less than a year now, if I was to go without it completely, I would really miss it. Um, but other people find they've, they've tried it and they don't like having something else on them and they never want to use it again. So. It really depends on the person and, and the benefit you get from it. Yeah, I had to go without it for three months once when I was self-funding before I had the opportunity for NHS funding. I self-funded for three and a half years and I had to save up money for a visa application. And it was like, wow, you know, the, the home office needs me to have X amount of money sitting in a bank account for three months in order for them to approve my application to stay in the country. and. It, so, it felt so unfair to me, but it was what I had to do. And I thought, well, you know, my overall life plan is more important than three months of CGM. Yeah. And if I have super bad issues, I'm just going to need to make sure I test a lot. So I was testing like 10 or 12 times a day, and my A1C went up just a little tiny bit. And I did have some surprise hypos along the way. But 
I thought, okay, I'm just more grateful for being able to get back to it once I was done with that visa process and I got that um, financial kickback that I needed. Um, but yeah, you know, I appreciate being afraid of it, but at the same time, if you don't ever try and see if it has value, then you're avoiding the opportunity on the basis of what if. And um, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's worthwhile giving it a shot if you're in a position to try it now and take advantage of all the support and resources that you can to see if it works well for you. And if it doesn't, then I'm sure there's somebody who would like to buy the kit off you when you've finished with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Completely off-label discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to go back to some of the questions we've had from Facebook. Uh, I think one that it would be quite good to discuss, which is what is the criteria for having a pump? Because some people may not know. Okay. Um, if you're aged under 12, then multiple daily injections need to be either impractical or inappropriate. And they can be interpreted in, in any way that the clinician decides. So impractical might be that um, a parent has to take time off work to go and inject a child at school during the day. That makes NDI impractical. Um, inappropriate might be that the child has a fear of needles. That makes it inappropriate. Um, and, and you find me a child for whom it's appropriate to stick a needle through their skin four times a day. You know, it can be as simple as yeah. that. And yet another clinician will say, oh no, you know, it's totally appropriate. Children have all have been injecting for many years, so your child can too. So it really varies on, on the clinician. If you're age 12 or over, then basically you need to have failed at NDI, multiple daily injections. Failing at NDI means that you have an HbA1c of 8.5 in old money or more, despite best efforts. Now, best efforts means that you're carbohydrate counting, you're adjusting your doses um, according to the food that you're eating, according to your exercise, according to um, your results, um, and you're on uh, Lantus or Glargine. Yeah, if you can take them. And if, if you, you can take yeah, them. If there's some reason why you can't, then they can't use that against you. Or, and it is or, it doesn't have to be both, or you're having um, frequent and unpredictable hypos that either cause you an anxiety about their reoccurrence or affect your quality of life. Yeah. And again, you can see that is, although the criteria are said to be strict, that one can be interpreted in all sorts of different ways according to which clinician you're seeing. Now, somebody that's not so fond of insulin pumps um, is more likely to say, oh, no, you know, that doesn't apply to you, you're getting on quite well. And somebody that's more into pumps will, will, will apply that criteria and say far more people fit into it. Some people um, are getting an HbA1c of, let's say, 7.5, but in order to do that, they need to do eight injections a day. Well, if I was a clinician, I'd say that's not reasonable. So um, in, order to, in order to get an, a, a good HbA1c, you've got to do unacceptable things, and therefore you meet the criteria, because if you were to inject a reasonable number of times a day, such as five or six, then you wouldn't get an HbA1c of 8.5 or below. So it really is, uh, the, the interpretations are, are, are varied across the whole country. So if you, if you feel you meet the criteria or you feel that you're doing unreasonable things in order to get good control and your clinician is, is, or your uh, consultant is still not saying that you meet the criteria, then ask for a second opinion elsewhere. Yep. We've spoken to people who've been told that they don't meet the criteria um, and therefore they can't have a pump. And do you remember that lady that was that was um, refusing to go out at night because she was mm -hmm. hypoing every evening? And she and, and her doctor said that that was a perfectly reasonable lifestyle ad adaptation to have good control. But it's not, you know, having to stay in every single night is not a reasonable adaptation. <laughs> yeah. And when we say they vary across the country, we're not meaning that there's particular parts of the country where yes, everyone gets pump therapy, and there are other parts where it just stinks to need a pump. Um, when you're talking about England, our real sense is that there are some hospitals that have cultivated a center of excellence, and then there are more hospitals around them that never had a pump clinic, that just decided in the last few years to start doing pumps. And so it's not about the place where you live. It's not a postcode lottery situation necessarily. It's more about which hospital 
and how long has that clinic been operating, how much have they seen, what's their base of experience. So if a pump company uh, just helped get a particular hospital online with helping them understand how to identify candidates, how to get people started on pumps, then it may take them some time and some exposure to build their own base of experience. So when people tell me, oh, I've been waiting four years for my pump clinic to start at this hospital because they always told me that they would get around to having the training, now they finally have had the training and they still don't think that I could benefit from a pump. I wish that person had gotten in touch with us earlier and maybe had gotten into a hospital where they have a, a longer history and more exposure, more experience. But, um, you know, they didn't find us then. They found us now. Um, and yeah. You know, they may yet end up going back to that original hospital once they've been established on a pump. Hope that helps. Um, brilliant, thank you. Um, one of the questions I think would also be quite good to discuss is somebody said, what about accessible products for blind and partially sighted people? Why shouldn't we get the same access to things as sighted? Absolutely agree. Um, we know of people who are registered blind who are using pumps successfully because they can, they, they've actually got good enough close-up vision that they can see the screen of the pump. That's the thing, really. All the current pumps have LCD screens, so as long as you can see that LCD screen, then you can use your pump. Um, they usually give, um, what's the word, they usually give a vibration feedback when you're mm -hmm. clicking buttons, but you do actually need to be able to see your infusion site and um, and the screen of the pump in order to use it safely. Um, unlike with um, fully clicking pens, there aren't fully clicking pumps that will that will uh, take it, take it all you know that will enable somebody who's completely blind to use it. But as I say, we, we know people who are registered blind who use pumps, and other people who just don't have that vision. At the moment. I guess there isn't the market for the pump companies to produce that. If enough people who really couldn't, didn't have any vision at all, were to pressurise the companies, perhaps they would come up with something. But really, it's it's quite a small market at the moment, so they're just not doing it, unfortunately. And as Leslie alluded to, because there are parts of the system that, in order to be safe, you need either for someone else to check it to make sure that your infusion site isn't irritated to make sure that your infusion tubing is connected safely to your site and it's not just kind of loosely attached. Um, and the fact that there is a touch feedback for the vibrating on the pump, but, you know, that's helpful. But there's still some things that, when it comes down to it, um, it's about how independent the person wants to be as well. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. someone's willing to accept some help from a carer or a friend to make sure that they're staying safe, then they may actually be able to use some of the current generation devices quite safely. So some of it's down to what's the experience you want um, and what's the capability of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and having access to that helper as well because it, it's not like you could ask somebody to have a look at your infusion set once a day and, t and confirm that it's all right because there may come a time at another point in the day when you think, hold on, my blood glucose level is rising, I need to check my infusion site. And, you know, you need somebody to be able to help you right then. Yeah, I, I wish that there were some easy answers and, yeah. um, you know, it, it's tough. Um, and certainly being part of the community and perhaps there's room in this big DOC for somebody who blogs as a visually impaired person with type 1 who can make their voice really heard yeah. um, and make that a USP. Um, yeah. Um, one question that I think could be quite good to discuss, and we've kind of touched upon it before. Um, what does CGMs cost to buy? Can they be rented? And what are the running costs? Um, plus or minus 20% ballpark figures, please. Okay. Um, we 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 can't. You know, we're not going to do sales here. We're uh, we're <laughs> we will help people to get access to it. So um, you need to contact the companies to get the up-to-date prices, and you can follow links from our website. But I can tell you what I use. Um, the set I use cost uh, 1,100 pounds to buy the initial setup. Each set uh, I pay 250 pounds for a box of four sensors, 
and each sensor lasts me at least three weeks. Um, so that's the realistic cost. Some people find they get uh, less than three weeks out of it, some people get more. Um, and I think probably the, all three sets are around that kind of level. Yeah, so not cheap, but when you think about what you're trying to get out of it and whether you can extend the wear, then you might get quite a lot of value. Um, and remembering that the pump companies and CGM companies can only talk about what is actually in writing and is their policy, um, you may have to look a bit broader to get the support that you'd need if you wanted to try to do things that they can't talk about like using a sensor for longer than seven days, for instance, mm -hmm. or using it in a place that they don't recommend. I mean, they all recommend that you use the sensors in the abdomen. I've, uh, I've used, since April, I've, I've used two abdominal sites and the rest have been elsewhere. Yeah. And because the different companies have different registered indications, you might hear that somebody uses brand A TGM in their arm and that the company behind that product shows a photo of somebody using that product in their arm. And that's okay because they've got the data to back that up. But company B might not have the same data and yet you see a photo of somebody that you see online as a friend or just a random who's got that product in their arm. Um, you can't see any photos like that on the company's website. That's legit. That's where the diabetes online community comes in really helpful. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Um, just one last thing. I wondered whether you guys had any questions for the people in the room as well. Give you a chance to ask the questions, as opposed to being on the <laughs> hot spot with all the answers as well. Um, well, I suppose given you're an interested audience, if anyone would like to have a look on our website and give us some feedback, anything that you think we could do different, better. Uh, anything that's missing or anything that's particularly valuable, we'd love your opinions. There is a Survey Monkey link um, on the front page in the bottom right hand corner. So you can follow a, a, a structured QA feedback for the website. That would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And we'd also love to know if you come across anybody in a chat room or forum, um, another hangout, who might benefit from being in touch with us. You can do us a massive service and them a service too by letting them know about us, giving them our email address, website, um, preferably the website because a lot of times people will send us an email and I'll reply with a link to a page on the website and they go, oh, I feel a bit silly. Um, I could have read that. I'm like, that's okay. It's only the home page. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I think as a community, we try to support each other and we want to make sure that if more people hear about us, more people we can help. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know as well, we've had some thank yous for answering the question. So David said, thanks for that. Really helpful. Self-funding seems the way at the moment, and I can see why too. Just need to fund it now. And mm -hmm. Heidi has replied saying, thank you for your reply. I feel a little more confident in having the pump now. I look forward to not having nighttime hypos as I approach my 37th anniversary of being an insulin-dependent diabetic. Here's my pump fitting day in March. So, um, oh, great. Yeah, just wanted to say thank you both for taking the time this evening to answer everyone's questions. It's been absolutely brilliant to have you here. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we really just like appreciate to say it. to everybody, whatever you're doing, whether or not you're using a pump, whether or not you're using, using CGM, um, don't do it alone. The online community is so large that um, you will find a place to fit in somewhere. and. Whatever you're being, whatever you're learning at your clinic, is going to be limited to the staff, their ideas, what they've taken on board, what they're excited by. If you get involved with the online community, then you can learn from a whole bunch of clinics. Um, I have learned so much more from the online community, like um, things that I've picked up. It, it, everybody's reading the internet, so I'll hear about things that. I, I might not have found myself or my clinic might not have told me coffee helping after you've had a hypo, that sort of thing. Uh, and I can go into that later if anybody wants. But 
really try and find a place in the online community where where you feel comfortable and where you feel supported. It's 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 a great support. I would encourage everybody to stay involved. And thanks for having us. It's been great yeah. fun. And thanks for patience and for <laughs> um for remaining in good humor with us. Yeah. And uh, I've seen smiles on the webcams, so I like that. <laughs> yeah. I smile a lot too, so you smile back. Um, Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been invaluable. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for everyone. coming here. Have a great night. Have a lovely evening, everyone, and see you next week. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye.